Hello everyone, welcome back to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ilopathology.com and supported by Visdolia, which is an amazing AI study tool. At the end of this session, you will be having practice sessions via Visdolia. So in continuation with the autoimmune diseases series, we were talking about SLE, right? So we had discussed about the autoantibodies involved in SLE. We have discussed about the pathogenesis and mechanisms of tissue injury in SLE. And now let's learn about the various morphological features of SLE. So remember, the morphology of SLE is extremely variable. The characteristic lesions as we have learned results from immune complex deposition in various tissues and organs like the blood vessels, kidneys, connective tissue and skin. Now let's talk about the morphological features in these tissues and organs where there is immune complex deposition. Firstly, blood vessels. The characteristic feature of SLE involving the blood vessels is acute necrotizing vasculitis. You know, it involves small blood vessels, particularly the capillaries, small arteries and arterioles. It can be present in any tissue of the body. But remember, the large vessel necrotizing vasculitis is less common as compared to that of small vessel necrotizing vasculitis. You can at times see thrombotic microangiopathy. So, morphological features in acute stage include, as we know, it is acute vasculitis, meaning there will be neutrophilic infiltration in the vessel wall along with necrosis of the vessel wall. Right. So, this vessel wall necrosis, when it combines with the deposits of immune complexes, the complement and plasma protein, it results in somewhat smudgy eosinophilic area of tissue destruction, which is referred to as fibrinoid necrosis. So, we look for neutrophilic infiltration as well as fibrinoid necrosis in the vessel walls, particularly the small blood vessels. In the chronic stage, what really happens is that the vessels, the blood vessels undergo fibrous thickening, causing significant narrowing of the lumen and the consequences thereof. So moving on to understanding the morphological features of kidney, clinically significant renal involvement happens in 50% of patients with systemic lupus erythematosus and the lesions in kidney can be categorized into glomerular lesions and tubulointerstitial lesions. Glomerular lesions are referred to as glomerulonephritis and tubulointerstitial are referred to as tubulointerstitial nephritis. So, let's learn about glomerular lesions. That's because of again deposition of immune complexes and these deposits can be in the glomerular basement membrane. It can be in the mesangium and sometimes throughout the glomerulus. And Rightly, the glomerular lesions are referred to as lupus nephritis, right? So, this lupus nephritis has six different morphological patterns starting from class 1 to class 6. See, the class 1 is the least common pattern and the class 4 is the most common pattern. So, let's learn about different patterns in lupus nephritis. So, I told you class 1 to class 6. See, the class 1 is referred to as minimal mesangial lupus nephritis. So, as I told you earlier, this is the least common pattern where the immune complex deposition is seen in the mesangium, right? There will be no structural changes in the light microscopic examination. That means HND strained sections do not show any morphological features, but then you do find immune complex deposition when you do a immunofluorescence and electron microscopic examination. The class 2 is referred to as mesangial proliferative lupus nephritis. Okay, as the name says, there will be proliferation of mesangial cells as well as accumulation of matrix in the mesangium. That's a mesangial matrix. Okay, so this is a you know, PAS stain which shows the proliferation of the mesangial cells as well as some amount of mesangial matrix accumulation. Remember, there will be no involvement of the glomerular capillaries. That means the endothelium of the glomerular capillary is not involved. It's purely mesangial. Immunofluorescence and electron microscopy do demonstrate granular mesangial deposit of immunoglobulin and complement. So the class 3 is referred to as focal lupus nephritis. So when we say focal, it means involvement of less than 
50 percent of the glomeruli okay among the glomeruli involved it can be segmental or global segmental meaning only the portion of the glomerulus is involved global means the entire glomerulus is involved right see the entire glomerular involvement in less than 50 percent of all glomeruli is focus lupus nephritis which is a global pattern so what do you see you find there will be swelling and proliferation of the endothelial cells of the capillaries as well as the mesangial cells right so there is proliferation of endothelial and the mesangial along with infiltration by the leukocytes there can be capillary wall necrosis you can see some amount of hyaline thrombi in few of these blood vessels rarely very rarely if the proliferation is too much you can see crescent formation as well right so that's type 3 now moving on to class 4 which we told it is the most common type and it is referred to as diffuse lupus nephritis it's the most common most severe which means diffuse focal meaning less than 50 percent diffuse is more than that right so this is the most common and the most severe form of lupus nephritis where you find proliferation of the endothelial that's of capillary lining, proliferation of the mesangial as well as proliferation of the epithelial cells lining the Bowman's capsule, right? Bowman's space. So you find proliferation of everything, endothelial, mesangial and epithelial cells that resulting in formation of crescents. Sometimes these crescents, which they can fill the entire Bowman's space. The glomerular involvement can be seg segmental or global. Segmental, as I told you, only focal part of the glomerulus is involved, whereas global is the entire glomerulus is involved. So when it is segmental, it is called class 4, yes. If it is global, it is called class 4G. The subendothelial immune complex deposits leads to, you know, circumferential thickening of the capillary wall. Okay, you can find circumferential thickening of the capillary walls. That's because of subendothelial tissue uh, immune complex deposits, which, you know, is seen as wire loop. So that's why these are referred to as wire loop lesions in SLE, which is characteristic of pattern 4 of lupus nephritis, which is diffuse lupus nephritis. And this is the pattern of you know, renal involvement, which is often symptomatic. And the symptoms could be hematuria, proteinuria and hypertension. See, the next pattern is class 5, which is referred to as membranous lupus nephritis, where there is diffuse thickening of the capillary walls due to deposition of subepithelial immune complexes. So, this is a class 5 showing diffuse thickening of the capillary walls. This is a PAS strain. Okay. And that the reason for that is increased production of basement membrane like material. Right. This is a higher power view showing diffuse thickening of the capillary walls. And the last one is the class 6, which is referred to as advanced sclerosing lupus nephritis. As the name says, there is sclerosis of more than 90% of the glomeruli and this is end stage renal disease. So moving on to tubular lesions, that's again because of deposition of immune complexes on the tubular or peritubular capillary basement membranes. Okay, remember it is tubular or peritubular capillary basement membranes. Very rarely tubular you know, uh, involvement can be the dominant abnormality. Okay, you can sometimes see lymphoid follicles along with numerous plasma cells and these may be the source of autoantibodies. So that's about the renal lesions. Now moving on to understanding the skin lesions. The classical feature, the characteristic feature is the erythema which affects the face along the bridge of the nose and cheek. Okay. This is characteristic. It resembles that of a butterfly and that's why it's referred to as butterfly rash which is seen in around 50% of patients. And of course, similar kind of rash may be seen on the extremities as well and also the trunk. Very rarely, uh, lesions can be manifested as urticaria, bullae or maculopapular lesions and rarely ulcerations can also be noted. So, histological examination of these skin lesions will show lymphohistiocytic infiltrate. That means there will be infiltration of lymphocytes and histiocytes where in the junction between the dermis and the epidermis. 
okay at times you know this kind of infiltrate can lead to separation of dermoepidermal junction you can also see vasculitis of the superficial vessels in the dermis so that's about the skin lesions now moving on to the cardiac lesions so remember the damage can occur to any layer of the heart okay it could be pericardium endocardium or the myocardium pericardial involvement is seen up to 50% of patients myocardial is very less common as compared to that of the pericardial involvement the myocardial involvement results in resting tachycardia and some you know subtle electrocardiographic abnormalities Yet, there can be valvular involvement also most often mitral and aortic valve involvement where there will be diffuse leaflet thickening leading on to the dysfunction you know, in form of stenosis or regurgitation of these two valves it i mean there can be endocarditis involving the valve that's valvular endocarditis so that is referred to as libman sack endocarditis okay this is also referred to as verrucous merantic or non bacterial thrombotic endocarditis so in this kind of endocarditis you find the vegetations on the ventricular surface as well as on the atrial surface and these vegetations and these vegetations are warty deposits which can be you know are on 1 to 3 mm very rarely up to 1 cm in size another important cardiac manifestation is the coronary artery disease right in the form of atherosclerosis of coronary blood vessels okay the mechanism is multifactorial see the risk factors for atherosclerosis which includes hypertension obesity hyperlipidemia they are much more common in sle patients than compared to the normal population there can be immune complexes and on anti phospholipid antibodies you know that can result in the damage to the endothelium of these coronary blood vessels and because of the damage it can promote atherosclerosis okay so these are the possible mechanisms for coronary atherosclerosis in systemic lupus erythematosus the morphological features in some of the other organs include spleen there can be splenomegaly that's because of follicular hyperplasia you do find onion skin like lesions because of concentric thickening around the blood vessels in the spleen okay the pleuritis and pleural effusion is seen in 50% of patients with lung involvement in sle there can be chronic interstitial fibrosis in long standing disease you can find le body or hematoxylin bodies in the bone marrow of these patients hypoplastic germinal center and very rarely the lymph nodes show necrotizing lymphadenitis so this is all about the morphological features of systemic lupus erythematosus now it's time to solve the practice sessions this is via visdolia i suggest you to click on the link below in the pinned comment or in the description just to solve these multiple choice questions there are you know short answer type of questions and also the clinical scenario based questions the best part of attempting these questions via visdolia is that you do get instant feedback whenever you go wrong and i feel it's fun to learn this way in the next session let's learn about the clinical features and lab diagnosis of systemic lupus erythematosus thank you for watching if you have liked this video hit the like button do comment if you have any queries to ask or if you appreciate the content if you feel the content is worth watching then do consider subscribing and don't forget to share thank you